Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. Today we are here with the U.S. Representative of Ohio's 9th Congressional District, Marcy Kaptur. Congresswoman Kaptur, thank you so much for sitting with us and talking about trade. What a pleasure to be with you and I know your members are listening and your officers. Special greetings to all of them. Excellent. Let's jump right in and talk about trade. Um, a quick Google search of your name and the word <laughs> and the acronyms TPP or mm -hmm. TPA just spoke volumes. You're not a big fan of the current trade deals. No, because they're not working. They're not working for the majority of people and for those who do the work. Tell me what you mean by they're not working because there are a million and six people out there that will say you're wrong, you don't understand the information. But this is an issue. Sometimes even presidents of the United States say that. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> but this is an issue that you have literally made your platform almost something that you're so passionate about. Tell me yes. what you've seen and what's been happening that shows you these are bad trade deals. I've served in Congress a very long time thanks to the people who send me here and I was elected to try to help create jobs. And I was elected during a huge recession in the 1980s, the Reagan recession. And as I began to track where the jobs had gone and why there was such unemployment, it led me around the world. And when I really began to see, I'm, I'm from the working class myself, but I had the privilege of going on to college, graduating from high school, first person in my family that ever graduated from high school actually, so I had fresh eyes, and I didn't come from a dynasty political family. I was just trying to serve the people who elected me. And as I started to go to other countries, I started in Japan, i have been to Mexico, Vietnam, I started seeing things that almost seemed like off a movie set. And so, for example, during the 90s, when um, we were debating NAFTA, I went down to Mexico, I led a delegation down to Mexico, and I literally saw a street that was named Ohio and Michigan. And on this street were all, in the street corner, all these companies that had been literally picked up from the United States and moved down there. Um, during the 1980s, I went to Japan. And when I really saw Japan, what I saw was a closed market, and it's never changed. Less than 4% of the cars on their streets uh, today, 4% uh, was the same 4% uh, that in uh, 1985, when I first went there, were from any place else in the world. So I saw closed markets, and then I saw outsourced jobs. I saw the conditions under which the people were working and living. And I began to follow the thread of that around the world. And when I really saw what was happening, I saw that American big banks were financing investments in other places. Uh, people in those companies then were hired at very low wages. Our production was shut down here. The companies made big profits. They made a lot of money. But the workers in our country uh, got outsourced. And the people in those other countries they didn't earn enough to buy what they were making. When we talk about trade, if you're at the Machinist Union, you can say Galesburg, Illinois, you can say Maytag, and every machinist will know exactly what you're talking about. To us, it was it's almost a Trojan horse, kind of a warning sign of what happens with a bad trade deal. Newton, Iowa was the home of Fred Maytag. It's a small town in Iowa. And um, actually, we should start a caravan there. There should be a caravan that moves around our country to every place where we've had outsourced jobs, starting in Newton, Iowa. Fred Maytag, I don't know if he was a Democrat or a Republican, but he was a community-minded businessman who manufactured a truly fine product with a workforce that lived there. They were innovators. They invented everything. They were the best in America. And then to see it hollowed out by financial interests who had nothing to do with the design and manufacture of that product. And literally, it was almost like a leveraged buyout happened. Fred Maytag is buried in Newton. He looks over what had been his company, right? Gave his life to that company and to that town, and then it all disappeared. And if you look at the Census Bureau today, Poverty has increased in that community by 25%. So here you have a place, and Galesburg is no different, in terms of the people who were proud of what they made, 
They literally made it. They invented it. They patented it. They built it. They perfected it. They were proud of what they did. It was made in the USA. It was excellent. It was an e And when I saw a company like that outsourced and the product cheapened, I thought America's gotten weaker. America has become less because of this. Well, and what people don't understand is it's not just about the product and it's not just about these jobs. These jobs represent people and families and cities and generations of businesses that rely on a place like Maytag that once Maytag goes, it's, I just don't think they see that the dent it leaves, that sort of situation. That's right, it leaves the fabric of America weaker. And post NAFTA, the average salary of families in my region has gone down by about $7,000 a year. We've lost auto jobs, steel jobs, uh, companies that manufactured school supplies. Oh goodness, automotive parts, coffee makers, I mean uh, clothing companies, uh, shoe companies, just an exodus, companies that made um, uh, units for bathrooms, sinks and tubs, and gone. And you can go to those shuttered places, and then you can look on the internet and try to find where they skip to globally. And by the way, some of these companies try to hide it. So it's harder to find them now. I remember I brought women workers from Honduras and Dominican Republic up to our district one time, and they were working in the clothing industry. They were being paid 10 cents per t-shirt. They got to my community, we took them to some shopping centers, they found the t-shirts that they made, they were selling for $20. They couldn't, they... Did they know? Did they know that... No, they had no, these were young women, they were exploited workers, they came on a religious exchange, they were shocked. They'd never been in America before, they were all under 30 years of age. It's, it's a tragedy. Well, right now, the, the trade bill that everyone's talking about is TPP, right. and they're calling that, I know uh, Labor calls that <laughs> NAFTA on steroids sometimes, right. and we're worried, there's no doubt. For someone who's not inside the Beltway, there's a situation with TPP, the Fast Track or the TPA. Can you explain a little bit what that means and what that's about? Because I know you've been passing some legislation to try and make that situation more transparent. Right. I have a bill that would basically say, hey, before we pass any agreement like this, give Congress a couple months to read it and figure out exactly what's in it. Right now, even though I have read the agreement and I have some questions about what different provisions mean or how they might be interpreted, I can't even talk about it publicly under threat of criminal prosecution. What kind of a law is that that undermines the rights of members of Congress who are elected by the American people. We are their brain and voice here, and yet we are throttled. We are shut off in our ability to even talk about it. And what the president wants to do, and presidents before him, the executive branch, they want to bring these agreements before Congress and say to us, take a vote that basically if you agree to vote on the final agreement, you have 60 days to read it when it goes public, but you can't amend it. But give us the right to give you the two months to read it publicly, and then you can say yes or no to the whole agreement. So if there's a provision in there that we don't like for some reason, we can't change it. I mean, what kind of mindless us usurpation of power by the executive branch is this? I think it's a constitutional breach. I think what we are looking at is a thousand page treaty. It ought to be considered uh, unconstitutionally uh, as a treaty. Uh, be open to full sunlight in the Senate and not brought up here under this artificial uh, trade promotion authority which basically just says uh, uh, give them free reign and you have no right uh, congresswoman to amend it uh, yeah you can read it publicly now so what and then swallow the whole pill up or down not very smart well and I have middle America I mean middle class our members ask all the time, is that even legal? How is this, how is all this secrecy okay? How is this situation even happening when we elected the people in Congress and we put the president where he's at? That's right. That's right. The president's wrong on this one. Presidents like this because it throttles Congress. 
It shuts us down. We can't question it. We can't try to insert language. Like there's one provision I very much want to get in there, which is in other former trade agreements. I can't tell you what it is publicly. Isn't that something? And um, all I can tell you is that it is a very important issue, important to our country. And um, I can't tell you about it. And I will not have the right to insert it in this agreement so that it matches what's in some of our former trade agreements. Uh, I won't have that right. Well, and manufacturing was one of those industries that was hit particularly hard, especially in your area, in your state, in your district. What does it look like now back home as compared to the oh. way it looked before these trade deals? Oh, my goodness. Um, if I look at the major cities that I represent, like Cleveland, Ohio, and Toledo, Ohio, and Lorain, Ohio, what's happened in Cleveland and Toledo is that the health systems have become some of the major employers in those cities. Um, whereas before, you had major manufacturing corporations that led the job creation in those regions. And I just experienced in Lorain, Ohio, an additional over 800 steelworker jobs. Uh, they were pink slipped. And imported steel was coming through the port of Cleveland that same week. I'm going, uh, is there any connection here? You betcha there is. And there'll have to be a trade complaint filed. Uh, and then that'll take five years. And then more people will be out of work, you know, under these trade laws. Meanwhile, many of these countries that we trade with have closed markets. No president. No president has been able to open Japan's market. No president has been able to make the Chinese market function in a transparent way. All you have to do is look around the world. Mexico, uh, we are now a trade debtor to Mexico, to Canada. We just keep doling out our jobs, you know, and I keep saying, okay, so we've already given away 20% of our growth. Um, almost every year, how, how high are they going to, how much are they going to take away? Are they going to take away 30%, 40%? But what do we do? I mean, there are men and women that live the consequences of these bad trade deals all over this country, all over the world. What can they do? What advice do you have for them? Because there are moments where they're feeling a little bit helpless and hopeless, and they'll, they'll, they are not afraid to say that anymore out loud. Right. They're, oh, they say it to me many times. And what they also say is, keep fighting. And I can tell you, when we first argued against uh, trade back in the 1980s, the kind of closed trade um, markets that there are globally, people didn't know what we were talking about. They didn't, they didn't even think about trade, that jobs and trade were absolutely integrally related. Now, look. The whole country is watching what we're doing here. That is, believe it or not, progress in the sense that the American people are paying attention. People are organizing against more of the same. They're asking presidential candidates. And look what these candidates say they're going to do. And then when they get in office, they don't do it. So there's kind of a truth squad that's operating out there now. So I would say this issue has matured. And it isn't easy because you are going up against the most powerful economic forces in the world that have the money and the power to move our jobs to third world locations behind barbed wire and hide what is actually happening. And the good thing is that the workers of our country have not become hopeless, but they have organized and saying, we can't take it anymore. And then say to any one of these presidential candidates that's out there, you want to be president? What are you going to do to balance our trade accounts? What's the first bill you're going to introduce when you become president of the United States? What are you going to talk about in your State of the Union to rectify this situation which has harmed millions and millions and millions and millions of people in this country? And then listen to their answers. That's it for this edition of Viewpoint. Thanks for joining us.